Oh, I'm sure anything covers up your face. Got to be an improvement. <laughs> you should see what you look like. Your eyes are like a cat's eye. It's very green. It's amazing. You see everything's plain as day. Oh, buddy, I can't see a wink. I can't even see you. Just turn the lights in. Well, hang on. I turn these off first. Oh, man, that's pretty. See, you look much, much better. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's uh, surprisingly comfortable. Your hands yeah. are free. It's not bad at all. Not heavy? No. You feel a bit like a uh, robocop in the wildlife division, though. I think I'll go uh, get a poacher or something. <laughs> Newfoundland Sportsman with White Blackwood and Paul Amundsen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me as the Minister of Natural Resources for Newfoundland and Labrador and the Minister responsible for wildlife to uh, say a few words today introducing this show on wildlife activities in the province. The wildlife resource is a very significant one to us in this province economically. Approximately, I would say, about $100 million per year is spent on wildlife activities, whether uh, fishing, hunting, or other related activities throughout the province. As a Newfoundlander, born and raised in the, in the tradition of fishing and hunting throughout this province, I participate myself annually. Every summer I, I fish for salmon, I fish for trout. In the fall, I get involved in big game hunting. Sometimes in the past I've been involved in uh, small game and birds, but in recent years not so much, mainly because of my schedule. I'm very concerned personally that we uh, maintain a, a great resource in the wildlife sector. And as the minister responsible for wildlife, I am very pleased with the staff that we have. We have a, a great staff of enforcement officers who are trained to uh, catch any offense. We have a zero tolerance for illegal activities. And we are going to make sure, we are going to make sure that things are done for the benefit in the long term of hunting and fishing and other related activities in this province. Uh, we've all heard the horror stories of extensive moose poaching, of caribou and seabirds being commercially slaughtered. How big a problem do we have in this province? Well, I think the problem has really gotten uh, fairly large in some areas, Dwight. In my 17 years now with the Wallet Division, I guess first when I started out, a lot of the poaching of big game especially was mostly to put food on the table. Somebody went and took a animal. It seems to be the last number of years now that commercialization has got a big part of that. People are out slaughtering 10, 15, 20, 30 animals in, in a month of a year. Uh, we've had some big operations on the go, and this is more the reason why we've had to get into undercover operations, covert operations, that type of thing, to try yeah. to address those concerns. Yeah, I understand you've got a fairly elaborate undercover operation, sting operations that I almost quantify them as. Yeah, it's kind of new to us over the last three or four years. Uh, it works quite effective. Uh, we're very concerned about uh, looking after the officer's uh, identity and these types of things and uh, other officer safety concerns. But to address the commercial op operation that went on in the Labrador Wester the past year or two, uh, we had to go in there in a fairly extensive undercover operation. We identified where people were taking caribou. The caribou were being shipped out of the province. And I don't mean just a few caribou. We went in with a tractor trailer load. Uh, with a tractor trailer and loaded up the uh, caribou. Fill right up. And we bought the caribou off uh, people up in that area. Also, we've had to put operations in place here uh, in different areas of the province of having our officers disguised as uh, hunters, as anglers, as even roadside workers, construction exactly. workers, uh, to get in to gather that intelligence that's going on in the community. Our, rec our regular patrols, conventional methods of enforcement didn't seem to work. We were in the areas doing patrols, but this was still going on. And the only way to really infiltrate that type of activity was to do an undercover operation. Yeah, that could be interesting, but could also be dangerous as well. Now, more recently, you've issued your conservation officers with some new equipment, haven't you? Yeah, we have uh, 
Uh, from an officer safety perspective, we have trained and issued our officers with handcuffs and batons. We've also trained and issued them in uh, OC spray, commonly called pepper spray, which you might be aware of. As well, we've uh, picked up some elaborate night vision equipment, and you've certainly seen some of the effects of our night vision equipment. Yeah, I saw a Robocop trying it on. Think you can use him? <laughs> Not like he is now, but uh, with a bit of extensive training, I think we might be able to do something with him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Bill, I must say I was really impressed with this. I had it on earlier in the dark room and uh, it's amazing. They are an impressive piece of equipment, uh, Paul. I understand that uh, 20 years ago that they were actually top secret and they were for military use only. And I also understand during the Persian Gulf War, uh, the pilots used these things uh, quite extensively. And it's, yeah, we it's, saw that on TV, yeah. And it's one of the main reasons why they were so successful. But the way they work is that they just, uh, what I understand is that, is that they magnify the light uh, several thousand times just from existing starlight or reflection off clouds. So I, must say, I was really impressed with it. It was amazing what you can say. Well, basically, you can see you've got daylight at night. There you go. Yeah. Now, this is a, uh, for your defense. That's our latest addition to our uh, personal safety equipment. That's the uh, OC spray or Olaris and Capsicum. And basically, what it is is the active ingredient uh, that's in a capsicum uh, or in a jalapeno pepper. And the idea is just to immobilize the individual by spraying it in their face, in their eyes. It has no long-term effects. Uh, you, you make the arrest and you transport your prisoner and the antidote is simply just uh, water. So you just spray and, and that's it? That's right. Excellent. Now this is a bit different from the, I've seen these with the police officers have uh, a much longer space between them. Uh, well the reason for that is uh, the police uh, vehicles have those uh, plexiglass screens uh, so that they can put their prisoners in the back away from, uh, away from the officers. But in our case we don't have those plexiglass screens in our vehicles. Uh, so our prisoner has to travel along. He's up in the front us. seat with you, yeah. So it restricts their movement. Yeah. And this strange looking thing? Yeah, that is the collapsible baton. We were issued out, uh, issued with them uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, prior to this, we had the regular baton that all police agencies uh, use. Uh, we're trained uh, in the use of these with the pressure point control uh, tactic training. And the idea is that uh, what we do is uh, we strike people in, play, in nerve endings and certain locations of their body away from the joint so we don't break any bones and the idea is temporary muscle paralysis. And no permanent damage. That's right. Yeah. Well too bad Dwight's not here, we could have, uh, have you demonstrate a bit. Yes, but uh, this is interesting, but you have some uh, other things you want to show me on the road, so we're going to get in the trucks to take off and uh, see what else you have in store for you for the day. Sounds good. Outdoor enthusiast, Newfoundland and Labrador offers excitement second to none, and the Newfoundland Sportsman magazine brings that excitement home to you. Subscribe now and begin enjoying interesting and informative features with exceptional photography, focusing on every aspect of our great outdoors. Order now and receive six issues a year for the low price of only $21.35, or subscribe for two years and get 12 issues for only $38.04 and save 25% off newsstand prices. The Newfoundland Sportsman Magazine, outdoors at its best. Hi, George. Hi, George. Hello. Hello. How are you today? I'm anxious to meet your dog. Well, this is Key. This is Key. What kind of dog is it? He's a uh, Belgian Shepherd, and he's uh, about four years old. Now you've had him. You've been training him for now what? Three years. It's been three years. Uh, he's uh, was about nine months old when I got him, and I started training with him when he was just about a year old. And he's trained to do what kind of police work? Uh, a whole variety of police work, everything from searching and tracking for persons to uh, to lost persons to uh, suspects in, in crimes, uh, to looking for narcotics, uh, articles of clothing, obedience or retrieving aggression. And crowd control is a wide scope. So he's got, he's got a wide scope of he things sure that he's trained for. He sure does. Now, I understand besides your police duties, you often get involved with, uh, with wildlife. I sure do. Uh, quite often they'll call me uh, to assist him in matters where a person may have left or discarded or hidden a gun, a knapsack or some other item uh, that uh, they need to, uh, to help uh, prove their case. Now, for instance, he'll, when he goes in the woods looking for something, he'll hunt out anything that smelled human or anything that smells different? He'll uh, look for things uh, specifically with uh, human scent and things which would be uh, foreign to an area. 
Um, a weapon, for instance, has a very strong uh, smell on its own, uh, which you'll look for, and it also may have some human scent attached to it. Now, you guys have set up a little demonstration for us today. We have. Uh, we've uh, we've uh, set up a scenario as if Kevin had just come along and observed a vehicle and a person walking to it, and uh, he feels that the person hid, hid or discarded the weapon out there, and he wants me to go search for it and help him out. Excellent. Go right ahead and show us. Okay. Let's go, Kevin. Back, son. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Okay, so out. Out. Good boy. Good boy. You found it for us, Kevin. Good, good, good dog. Hey, that's a boy. Yes, sir. That's a fucking dog. Good boy. There you go. That's a puppy. Good job. That's a fella. Puppy gets out. Good boy. That was very impressive, guys. There you are, Kevin. Yes, yeah. uh, Paul. Took Quite no easy, time actually. at all, eh? Also good, as I said before, the human scent is there, as well as the scent of the actual gun itself. And it, in fact, made it fairly easy. Yes, he had no time at all. Just back and forth, nailed it. Not at all. I can see how this uh, cooperation really works for you guys. I mean, this saved you a lot of trouble. If you're beating the bush. It certainly did uh, save us a lot of trouble. We could uh, we could be there for an hour or so and maybe not even come up with anything. And never right. come up with it. That's true. And he'll find pretty much anything. Like Just about wall shells, anything at all. Uh, clothing, knapsacks, knives. Uh, we don't uh, we don't specifically look for animal, but we we look for anything that relates to the hunting aspect of it. Anything human at all. Anything human. Excellent. Well, I've got a lot of guns here. I guess this is probably a small portion of what you've gotten across your island over the past 12 months, is it? Yeah, no question. Dwight, every year we do seize a lot of firearms, a lot of different exhibits. Uh, in the line of firearms, we probably seize uh, three or 400 in one of a year. Now, what about your ATVs and your skidoos and your boats and vehicles that you've seized? Do the people that, that had them confiscated, do they get a chance to get them back? Well, once they've confiscated, gone through the court process, and they've been forfeited to the Crown, uh, obviously, they become property of the Crown, so the government owns those vehicles and that now. Uh, for disposition purposes, we do uh, dispose of them through public auction, uh, at which case you, as the previous owner, uh, can bid on it, but the same as anybody else. You don't get any preference uh, of bidding, that you can go to these public auctions that are announced through the papers, and you can go bid on that article the same as anybody else would. So yes, there is an avenue there for you to probably acquire your vehicle back. Now, we saw a lot of moose meat out in your cooler out in Whitburn. I mean, one quarter I saw was as big as the four quarters and the animal I shot a few weeks ago. What do you do with all this meat? Well, we get meat uh, from roadkill animals, the animals that are involved in accidents. So there's a fair quantity of meat that we salvage in those accidents, as well as meat that once it goes through the court process and the appeal process in court, uh, we keep these meats in, uh, in the freezer facilities like you've, you've yeah. seen in some of the areas that we had. Um, most of the meat goes out to charitable organizations. Uh, we give it out to the Boy Scout movement, to the Red Cross, to uh, church groups, service groups, uh, for fundraising moose dinners. And we'll give them permits to have the meat, so we're not going to have yeah. to go back out and seize it, obviously. But uh, yeah, we, uh, we'll give it to them, and it's a great opportunity for the communities uh, to raise some uh, money for some well worthwhile projects, actually. And have a good meal besides. And have a good meal besides, Listen, yeah. some of these guns are in excellent shape. I wouldn't mind having a couple from my collection. This is a popular uh, hunting area uh, for moose and, uh, and rabbits. Uh, what I'll be checking here today is just to make sure that anybody is in here with a firearm does have a hunting license. In the case of moose hunters, uh, if they have a partner, make sure that the partners are hunting within sight of each other. And uh, I'll be also checking the small game hunters to make sure that they, uh, they're not carrying any illegal ammunition, ammunition that can be used for, uh, uh, be used for hunting big game. It's, uh, 
It's always nice to check uh, any parked vehicles uh, that you see in any back roads like this. Uh, well, to start with, especially, uh, it could be somebody that could be in some sort of trouble. I've often run into uh, uh, students, for example, uh, especially in the year in the times when they're registering for uh, the university and trade school. People are from out of town, they've got nowhere to stay. Uh, I've often come upon people that are asleep in their car. So they'd be sleeping in the car overnight, yeah. And uh, you want to watch for that sort of thing, especially if it's been a cold night or if they've left their motor running. And uh, I could be back in here another day's time and uh, the same vehicle might be here. And it indicated to me that if the same vehicle is in the same way with a, with a gun case on the seat and uh, the sweat, you know, and the doors unlocked, it indicated to me that somebody may have walked down here, they may be in some trouble, so. Somebody didn't return back to the car and that type of thing, yeah, yeah. for sure. And I'd, I'd make a note of that. I'd write it on my clipboard that I that I checked a certain vehicle and I'd have the plate number in case they, it, from time to time the police do call me and ask if I've seen a certain vehicle or a certain individual. But also what I'm looking for here is, uh, I want to know if I, if I am dealing with a hunter, it'd be nice to know uh, who I've got here or, or what I've got. In this case here, there is one gun case in the back of the seat. That's right, yeah. So I suspect that I, I do have uh, one hunter here. It looks seems to be a rifle case. And I see a lady's uh, sweater there uh, laid over the seat. So I suspect that I probably got a, a, a uh, perhaps a husband and wife team. The husband has a, uh, has a license and uh, he's down perhaps with his wife. Looks like a scope. It looks like as well. it looks like a larger case for uh, yep for so a scope large, mounted firearm. Yeah, so it's yep. large, uh, big game. That's right. Moose hunting, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Unarmed. Uh, we don't carry sidearms, and it's an issue with the, with the wildlife officers right now. We operate uh, at all hours, day and night, and from time to time, especially at night, uh, you do run into some hunters. But on occasion, people are drinking, and uh, besides the alcohol, they have the firearms in their vehicles. And uh, we do, from t on occasion, uh, have people that aren't all, all that agreeable with us. And there are situations, times like that, that you would feel comfortable, more comfortable with having a sidearm uh, to, de to handle those situations. We have had situations where our officers have been shot at and we have had situations where officers have had to back down because of, because of uh, they just knew that they were in over their heads. And uh, sometimes you may not have that opportunity to back down. They may be interested in training their firearm on you. I guess we're both wrong. It wasn't big game after all. He was after rabbits. No, he just he just happened that he used his uh, rifle case to put his shotgun in. That's all he was doing there. So. Yeah, he had a couple of dogs that weren't broken, so he didn't uh, he didn't get any rabbits. No, but it seems like he had a good day hunting anyway. A nice day for it now. I noticed you were just checking his ammunition, his license, the, the standard things. Yeah, and that plus if he had a head of pump or a semi-automatic uh, shotgun, I'd be checking for uh, the presence or absence of a slug or the or the slug being altered or the uh, I mean the presence or absence of a magazine mm -hmm. or the magazine being altered. Hopefully we'll break those dogs and get a couple of rabbits. It's a yeah. great bit of fun. There are other aspects of this job uh, besides the enforcement. Uh, besides protecting uh, the wildlife from the people, sometimes uh, we have to protect the people from the wildlife. And uh, I'm thinking of situations, for example, here in St. John's, uh, I have to remove moose on occasion. We get uh, 30 to 40 moose that wander in St. John's every year. Uh, on occasion, I have to remove the moose, tranquilize them, and uh, take them to wooded areas outside the city. Uh, outside the city of St. John's and Mount Pearl and surrounding areas. Also we get polar bears from time to time that wander in the communities and we're into a program now uh, over the last five years uh, we've relocated uh, polar bears that have wandered into communities and uh, we, we uh, truck them back north as far as we can. Also we're involved in research projects and you may have noticed that, for example the Area 35 uh, moose hunting area the license quota was reduced uh, by about half this year and in some other areas also. We also do public relations work, uh, for example, with the uh, uh, with the high schools and with uh, with Boy Scout groups and Girl Guides and Rod and Gun clubs. So we do have a variety of aspects to our job.
I noticed, Phil, that we have the uh, RCMP with us today. Yeah, well, we have the authority to, uh, to set up roadside checks whenever we want, but uh, whenever we can, we like to coordinate with the RCMP, and they can do a double check then. Uh, they're looking for seat belts and impaired drivers and other uh, violations. Yes, I guess you're, you're restricted to just the hunting aspects of it and this type of thing, so you're limited to how much of an inspection you could do on your own. That's right, but there are some things, like, for example, that we're concerned with, for example, the uh, alcohol in vehicles. People oftentimes are uh, drinking, sometimes when they're driving, and uh, when you mix that with firearms and with driving, it's, it's, uh, it's even worse than just drinking and driving. Well, I'm interested in seeing what uh, questions you guys ask and how you, how you uh, conduct your search. And hopefully we can get uh, somebody in public to speak to us, give us their opinions on uh, what you're doing, whether they appreciate it or finding it annoying or, or whatever the responses are. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. You've just been uh, pulled in at the road stop uh, checkpoint here mm -hmm. by the wildlife officer. How do you feel about being pulled in? No problem. I don't have any problem with it whatsoever. It's a good thing. Were you hunting today or...? Uh, just a little. Not, not a nice day. We didn't swim for a couple of hours, kind of thing. What but were you after? Uh, grouse, rabbits, you know, that kind of stuff. Just some, some small game. What were some of the things they, uh, they asked you to go through here? Uh, they checked my firearm, my registration, uh, my license, registration on the bike, that kind of stuff. Just your usual. The usual full standard, stuff. full coverage, too. Yes. So you, don't, you don't mind being stopped? You believe these not things are necessary? And, oh, and, uh, definitely necessary. There's lots of people out there who, uh, who are, you know, not doing the right thing, so I don't have a problem with it. Excellent. Now, we, we're just curious, though. We've been with the wall officer all day today type thing, and we were just trying to get some idea of the response from the public. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's some inconvenience to be stopped, but, I mean, I think it seems that the public is in support of it yes. and believe that it's necessary to do the job that they have to do. But uh, it's nice to see public like yourself uh, being agreeable and, and cooperative and uh, not having any problems or any oh, charges or anything. No problems with whatsoever. You were just stopped at a uh, checkpoint. <laughs> have you found it? <laughs> oh, I've been stopped. No, no, not at all. I think it's a proper thing to do about it. Are you a hunter yourself? No, I'm not a hunter, no. So you haven't been out hunting dice and boys and then what to say to you at all? Well, I, I just finished two years of uh, wildlife enforcement training. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, so you've, you've, you've seen this before then? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it should be more. We need more fellas on the go. Yeah, obviously, of, yeah. obviously they have to get out and stop the trucks and oh, check it out and this type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about being pulled in? Oh, uh, I don't mind. There's only a minor inconvenience. Are you a hunter yourself? Or? Uh, no, I am not. So I would have thought that you'd probably be more annoyed than, than most of the hunters. Well, I never knew that it was uh, for the wildlife. Uh, I just thought it was the police doing a routine check. So. Yeah, they seem to get together. The wildlife gets together with the police. Um, but basically, it's a wildlife stop. They're basically checking hunters and this type of thing. But uh, it's nice to see that the public supports it and, and sure. doesn't mind the inconvenience. Well, it's good, uh, you know. Keep uh, hunters in line too, right? Managing our natural resources is not a job that the Wildlife Division can do alone. We must all become involved as responsible citizens and assist them in weeding out those few individuals who through ignorance or for greed have such a devastating impact on our province's wildlife and ecosystem. It's equally important that we lead by example and instill in the hunters, anglers and outdoor enthusiasts of the future a respect and appreciation of our natural resources, thus ensuring those resources for generations to come. take this advantage to thank the Newfoundland Sportsman for your interest in the Wildlife Division and especially for your interest in our program, the Wildlife Enforcement. So as a little token from the Wildlife Division, we've got a cap here to make you an honorary wildlife officer. Oh, well, thank you very much. I knew with all this training I'd become a wildlife officer. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you very much, gentlemen. There you go. Well, as we really appreciate it. You and your staff have been just great. Oh, it's been a great, great day, great bit of fun. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Sure enjoyed it as well. Now, Paul, your head's not too swollen to put that on. No, it? no, no. Here's a little presentation. Listen, right on. I knew I shot a moose a couple of weeks ago. I saw you shoot your moose, uh, and I said, well, I'm going to have, seeing as I'm going to see you this week, I, uh, I said I'd get the crest for you, and I just want to 
personally congratulate you on your moose. Although Thanks, it's buddy. still our investigation who shot it. I didn't shoot it, but <laughs> I, I didn't cut it did up and carry it out. <laughs> moose collar of 1995. <laughs> still our investigation now, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shooting ducks from shore. Uh. <laughs> we uh, we came out this morning around six o'clock. Took a look at the water and it was a bit rough. Believe it or not. <laughs> came out about eight o'clock. Took a look. Went back on in. It calmed down a bit, so we came out. Yeah, uh, still not ideal conditions, as you can see. Gary, you don't mind this at all, yeah? Oh, well, rougher it is, the better I like it. I know. Get him. Yeah. Look at the wings on. That's why they're such good swimmers. Small wings driving through the water. 